Okay, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, tonight's lecture is entitled Return to the Land of Israel. We ended last week with the Jewish people after the Holocaust. When the American soldiers discovered the Jewish graveyard left by the Nazis in Europe, as well as the survivors of the concentration camps, they were unprepared for what they saw and shocked by what they found. The surviving Jews had no homes to return to, little or no family remaining, and were suffering in dire poverty. The ancient Jewish communities of Europe were gone. Looking back, they and their communities were devastated. And looking forward, the challenges for European Jewry seemed insurmountable. The anti-Semitism, as discussed last week by the local Europeans, continued even after World War II, especially among the Poles. There were pogroms and Jews were killed, often by people they knew. Emigration to other non-European countries was not an option as the quota system instituted against the Jews before World War II were still in place. My four grandparents were all Holocaust survivors, all spent time in the DP camps. None of them were able to get out until five years after the Holocaust. They were in DP camps for five years. My grandparents married the DP, camp, the DP camps. My aunt was born in the DP, DP, DP camp. And as far as the land of Israel, it was essentially closed as well. Only 1,500 Jews, approximately per month, were allowed, for it to, uh, were allowed by the British to enter Palestine, as England did not want to antagonize the Muslims. The vast majority of the survivors, hundreds of thousands of Jews, were left in the DP camps, which were guarded by soldiers in poverty and unwanted by the nations of the world. Concomitantly, concurrently, the sympathy for the Jews, and in general for Zionism, although nobody wanted the Jews, had grown remarkably as a result of what the Jews suffered under the Nazis. From 1945 to 1941, there was a groundswell of public support for the state of Israel, Israel by Jews worldwide, and in the United States in particular. In this short period of time, perhaps the only time it possibly could have been, the unthinkable happened. So just three years after the Holocaust, the Jewish people were allowed to return to the land of Israel. And tonight, we will discuss how the unthinkable occurred. Our desire to return to the land of Israel. As we started 20 lectures ago, Jews were forced to leave Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple in the year 70 of the Common Era. They did manage to stay in the land of Israel for the next approximate 300 years until Christianity became the religion of Rome, and the Christians, as discussed in lecture number three, for those who look back the tapes, started to persecute, persecute the Jews. They forced almost the entire Jewish settlement in Israel to be closed down. But yet, despite the fact that there were very, very few Jews left in the land of Israel, Jews always yearned for the land of Israel. Most of our Amida Shemona Esrei, a large part of the central part of Shemona Esrei, talks about returning to the land of Israel, rebuilding of Jerusalem, the Messianic era, the blessing in Berkas HaMalzon, Uvenei Yerushalayim. Every Seder night, one of the most memorable parts of the Seder is when we say, L'shana haba bi Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Throughout history, many of the great sages and individuals went back to the land of Israel whether it was under the Muslims, under the Turks, under the Christians even at, at certain points. Jews, there's a, a custom for generations uh, that Jews left a block of their house, part of it unmarked, to recognize that we are in the exile. We say it in Psalms by a wedding, Im Jerusalem, if I forget the if I forget the Jerusalem. Shir Hamalos which we say on Shabbos and on holidays, we say, we'll be dreaming we'll return to the land of, of, of Jerusalem. There's a famous statement of Rav Nachman Rav Breslov, that wherever I go, I'm going to Israel. And an even more famous statement 
of Rabbi Huda Aleven is Kuzari, my heart is in the east and I am in the west. Jews never forgot Jerusalem. And the, the land never forgot us. We never forgot the land of Israel. Wherever we were in the, in the exile, Jews pined to go to Israel. And remarkably, the land never forgot us. The land of Israel, historically, of course, the, with the Miraglin, with the spies, you see the land was very fertile. Look at source number one. This is from Shmos Gimel, Basuk 8, Exodus 3, 8. I've come down to rescue them from Egypt's power. I will bring them out of the land to a good, spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And a thousand plus years later, look at this quote, source number two, from Josephus, who we used in detail almost 19 lectures ago. For the whole area is excellent for crops and pasturage, and rich in trees of every kind, so that by its fertility, it invites even those least inclined to work on the land. In fact, every inch of it has been cultivated by the inhabitants, and not a parcel goes to waste. It is thickly covered with towns, and thanks to the natural abundance of the soil, the many villages are so densely populated that the smallest of them has more than 15,000 inhabitants. Josephus is talking about the period of the destruction of the Second Temple. And yet, once the Jewish people are exiled, the land will change dramatically. This, of course, is prophesied in Vayikra. Look at Leviticus 26, 32, 33, source number three. So devastated will I leave the land that your enemies who live there will be astonished. Your land will remain desolate and your cities in ruins. And for the vast period of time when the Jewish people were not in the land of Israel, that will be its fate. Look at source number four, which is the Ramban, Nachmanides, the great early 13th century Spanish sage, comment on that verse in Leviticus. Similarly, in which he stated here, and your enemies that shall dwell therein shall be desolate, and it constituted a good tiding, proclaiming that during all our exiles, our Lord will not accept our enemies. This is also a great proof and assurance to us. For in the whole inhabited part of the world, one cannot find such a good large land, which was always lived in, and yet is ruined as it is today, for since the time that we left it, has not accepted any nation or people that tr they all try to sell it, but to no avail. The land of Israel will become barren, and that was to our benefit. Could you imagine in the 19th century if Jews wanted to return, and the land of Israel was fertile, the land of milk and honey, if it was as densely populated as Singapore or Hong Kong, could there ever have been a return of the Jews? If there were millions of people living in the land of Israel, we would never have a shot to get back there. But the land was empty. The land was desolate. Look, source number five. This is um, Sir Will, Professor Sir William jo Sir John William Dawson in, in Modern Science and Bible Lands, London, 1888. Until today, no people has succeeded in establishing national dominion in the land of Israel. No national unity or spirit of nationalism has acquired any hold there. The mixed multitude of itinerant tribes that managed to settle there did so on lease as temporary residents. It seems that they await the return of the permanent residents of the land. There were some Bedouins in Israel, and that was about it. Source number six, Samuel Clemens, AKA Mark Twain, Innocence Abroad, 1867. I'll, just give, I'll read the, the, the important parts. We traversed some miles of desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. We'll just skip. We never saw a human being on the whole route. The end. No landscape exists that is more tiresome to the eye than that which bounds the approaches to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, and lifeless. I would not desire to live here. It is hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. 1867. And yet, when the Jewish people start to come back, the land changes. Look at source number seven, which is talked in Devarim, Lamedi, one, one up to five, Deuteronomy. Then the Almighty will bring back your captivity and have mercy upon you, and he will turn and gather from you from among the nations where he dispersed you. If your dispersed ones will be even at the ends of the heavens, i.e. from South Africa, or Australia, or San Francisco, <laughs> that's, that's close as you want to get to other below the heaven, 
If you disperse ones, will be even at the ends of the heavens. From he, he, there, God Almighty will gather you, and from there He will take you. And God, your Lord, will bring you to the land that your fathers inherited, and you shall inherit it. And He will do good for you and make you more numerous than your forefathers. Look at this quote, source number eight, from the great Marshall, one of the greatest commentators on Tosfus and on the Talmud Babli. Marshall, of course, was a great 16th century Polish sage. As long as Israel does not dwell in its land, the land does not give of her produce. As she is accustomed, when she will begin to reflourish, however, and give of her fruits in abundance, this is a clear sign that the end, the time of redemption, is approaching when all of Israel will return to the land. In the mid-1700s, Jews start to come back to the land of Israel. And the first Jews that would come back would be overwhelmingly the most pious, the most religious Jews in Europe. In the mid-1700s, Rabbi Gershon Kitover, who was the brother-in-law of the Baal Shem Tov, of the founder of the Hasidic movement, took several dozen, and after a few years, hundreds of Hasidim joined them, to Israel, to northern Israel, primarily to Tiberias. To Tiberias thus starting an Ashkenazic presence. Because until that point, there was a small Sephardic presence in Jerusalem and, and in Svat, and that was the, the settlers of the land of, of, of Israel. But in the early 19th century, it was the students of the Vilna Goyen who would really establish what is called the Yishuv Hayashan, the old settlement of the land of Israel. They would be the first to come. We discussed them previously, they were the Prushim. And there were three groups of disciples of the Logon that came between the years 1808 and 1812, way before the birth of Theodor Herzl or Pinsker or anyone else. They came and settled primarily in Svat in the Galilee. But in the year 1839, there was a tremendous earthquake killing hundreds of people in the Galilee. And the Svat was really destroyed. If you ever go to the, where the Ari Mikvah is in the cemetery in Svat, you can see the damage from the earthquake. It's the graves are still turned over some of them. The mountain is it's crooked. That's why Kohanim can't go anywhere near there because you don't even know where the graves are. That's all from the earthquake in 1839. These students of the Vilna Goyen then moved in mass to Jerusalem. And they revived the Jewish presence in Jerusalem. And they, once they came and established kolals in the community, European, Jews, but primarily from Lithuania, the students of the Goyen, and the yeshivas started to trickle in as well. And thus, before the Zionist movement would gain any fuel, by 1880, there were 40,000 Jews living in the land of Israel among some 250,000 Muslims. Almost all, without exception, of those 40,000 Jews who had come to the land of Israel will be termed today Haredi. They were all very religious Jews, be it Sephardi, be it Hasidic, and primarily students of the Vilna Goyen. Right. That was the community in 1880 in the land of Israel. At the turn of the 19th century, there were a few hundred, if not a couple thousand. By 1880, there were 40,000. Shmuel Salant, the famous Shmuel Salant, is the, rabbi, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and that is the community. One of the key figures of this time period was Sir Moses Montefiore, who lived from 1784, he lived a very long life, to 1887, he lived 103 years. And he was the first Jew to be knighted by the, uh, uh, to be knighted in Britain. Britain. And Montefiore made a killing with the Rothschilds. His wife and Nathan Rothschild's wife were sisters. He's a brother-in-law to Nathan Rothschild, and they invested together. And in the Battle of Waterloo, they used carrier pigeons. So Montefiore and Nathan Rothschild knew before anyone else that the British had won the Battle of Waterloo. And they bought the stock, English stock market, and they made a killing. This is before the SEC. Right? Yeah. They made a killing. Montefiore made enough to retire for life, and he devoted his life, he retired at the age of 40. Remember, he lived to 103. He devoted the last 63 years of his life to the Jewish people. He met with the Tsar of Russia for the Russian Jews during the Damascus affair. He met with the, the head of France. But primarily, he focused on Israeli Jewry. He focused on the land of Israel, which he view, visited numerous times in the 19th century, when it was not easy to, to visit, when it was very difficult to travel. And Montefiore 
Not only did he build the highest level of the Kotel, the, the small stones you see at top, that was built by Moses Montefiore because the Arabs used to throw garbage at the Jews who were praying at the Kotel. So he built up the wall in order that they couldn't throw garbage today. It's because of that wall that when they throw rocks, it's a good protection as well. But he also started the first settlement outside the old city. Because until Montefiore, Jews were scared to live outside the city. They were bandits. The Ottoman Empire was corrupt and inefficient, and that's why it was dissolved in World War I. And there was no security. Most Jews actually lived what today is called the Muslim Quarter. And the only gate to the old city was the Damascus Gate. But in 1858, with the encouragement and the finances of Sir Moses Montefiore, Yemin Moshe, named after Moses Montefiore, was founded, being the first uh, community built outside the old city. And other communities soon, soon were founded. One of the first was Meir Sharim in 1875, founded by students of the Vilna Gai. The other key figure of this time period was Baron Edmund de Rothschild who lived from 1845 to 1934. Rothschild, more than anyone else, bankrolled the settlement of the land of Israel. He gave, this is in the 19th century, 70 million francs. That's enormous, I mean, you can't, you can't even imagine, I mean, billions, enormous amounts of money to, to, to settle the land of Israel. He built cities like Rosh Pina, Zechron Yaakov, named after Baron Rothschild, Pardis Hanna, and many others. He started Carmel Winery, for example. So important was Rothschild that he was nicknamed Hanadiv Hayadua, the famous contributor. Imagine wherever he came, he got Shlishi and Shul, he was well known. Okay? Interestingly enough, Rothschild was quite assimilated. He was not a religious Jew. What made him give to the land of Israel? One of the first religious Zionists, named was Shmuel Molliver. And Rav Shmuel Molliver convinced Rothschild that if you invest in the land of Israel, that will be your eternal investment. Invest in the land of Israel, it will be your eternal investment. And Rothschild bought it. The funny thing is, his whole, whole family fortune was taken by the Nazis years later, including all the artwork. <laughs> the, but Pardis Hanna, Zichron Yaakov, now tens of hundreds of thousands of people living there, and we all enjoy caramel wine. Political Zionism, early political Zionism, it does not start until the late 19th century. And that really starts, because the lectures we discussed two or three lectures ago, about Russian, severe Russian oppression and anti-Semitism. Because the vast, vast majority of the early political Zionists were rabidly secular. Some of them, or actually at one point even a large percent of them, had been observant at youth, but completely rejected their heritage, and did not look to go to the land of Israel to build a land based on tradition or religion. Rather, as we'll soon see, they felt that the land of Israel was the only hope for the Jewish people. That's what led us in, in mass. That's where we could rebuild ourselves. And one of the first groups was called Chovei Tzion, Chibat Tzion, the lovers of Zion. And we'll see that the head of Chovei Tzion in its early years was a completely assimilated Jew named Dr. Leon Pinsker. Pinsker, who lived with was Russia, but was Poland part of Russia, he was a Haskalah person. He believed that the Jewish people should completely, thoroughly assimilate into Russian culture. If we assimilate into Russian culture, we will be loved. Then we'll be accepted. But remember a few lectures ago, just three lectures ago, when I mentioned 1881, when Tsar Alexander you know, was assassinated in 1881, there was a tremendous backlash. And the Jews and the people who believed in Odessa, that they love us, were reminded that we're still Jids. We're still hated. Pinsker had an about face. And he wrote a book called Auto-Emancipation. 
in which he penned these memorable, memorable words. We must reconcile ourselves to the idea that the other nations, by reason of their inherent natural antagonism, will forever reject us. Therefore, Pinsker believed that we had to go to the land of Israel. But not because of religious yearning, not the yearning that Jews had for 2,000 years of Birka Samozon and Shimona Esrei and Lashana Habai and Yushalayim at the Seder, because Pinsker did not have a Seder, and Pinsker did not bench, and Pinsker did not daven. The Jews had to go to the land of, the land of Israel. Concurrently with Pinsker, there was a movement in Russia, again, Russian Jewry, the ground is burning beneath their feet. They're being, pro they're being persecuted. And as mentioned in the lecture coming to America, starting in 1881, two million plus Jews come to America. There's another movement called Bilu. Bilu stands for Beis Yaakov, Lechuv, and Elcho, based on a Pasuk in Yeshaya, second parrot, verse 5. Beis Yaakov, Lechuv, and Elcho, house of Jacob, come, let us go. And this was what's called the first Aliyah. It was the first group of Jews who were not religious. Because until 1880, the 40,000 Jews were all Haredim. Haredim, that's who were there. The first group of Jews who were not religious. And they made an ascent. Aliyah Lilo means ascent. It's based on the term Aliyah Laregal, to go up to the Regal. And 30,000 Jews, over only a small percent of the Jews who left Russia between 1882 and 1891, 30,000 Jews went to the land in Israel and founded 28 new settlements. Most of these Jews were bankrolled and funded by Baron Rothschild. Hundreds of thousands of acres of land were bought with the money of Rothschild. But the Arabs who sold the land were living in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. And what did they sell to the Jews? They sold the worst land of Israel. We mentioned Twain, how the land was destitute and, and, and barren, well they gave the most barren, the most swamp filled parts of Israel, filled with malaria in the Hulu Valley in particular, and these settlers rebuilt the land. They drained the swamps, they put eucalyptus trees to drain the swamps. There were many Jews who suffered tremendously in rebuilding the land. They were very devoted. But as important as the Russian persecution in encouraging Eastern European Jewry, let's think about going to the land of Israel. There was, an, there was an event in Western Europe that shook up the Jews of Western Europe. In 1886, a virally anti-Semitic book, La France Juve, the Jews of France, which was the number one seller in France for years, was put on the market. Imagine the New York Times, Mein Kampf, <laughs> number one seller. This is a guy released, uh, by the way, the worst anti-Semitism in the late, intellectual anti-Semitism in the late 19th century was France. I mean, the Germans would take a lot of this in the 20th century, but France had, the, the conservatives in France were rabidly anti-Semitic. This was followed in 1890, 1892 by the founding of an, an anti-Semitic daily newspaper called La Libre Parola, excuse my French, uh, writes Rivera Wine in his Triumph of the Survival. Well, nowhere was this, uh, this periodical more popular than with the officer corps of the French army. Stung by anarchists and pacifists of the left, humiliated by its complete defeat in the Franco Prussian War of 1870, the French army was frustrated, malevolent, and paranoid. One of its main enemies was the Jewish influence in French life. This made the military the logical candidate for an anti-Semitic incident. It would not be long in coming. This anti-Semitic incident, which became known as France, as La Affaire, you look at any French history book, or you look at any history book in the Italian 19th century, this was one of the major events of the late 19th century. It, of course, was a Dreyfus Affair. Because in 1894, uh, uh, you had to pick, you couldn't pick a more benign individual as Alfred Dreyfus. Like, this spy, like this, you know, this Jewish geek, if you can excuse my language. Some, some guy with no, you can't even imagine 
He wasn't high in the army. He was a quiet guy to himself, the least likely to be a person to be a spy. And he was accused in 1894 of stabbing France in the back and giving the Germans the French war plans. He was the one, and that's why the French lost the Battle of 1870. Now, historically, it was not Dreyfus, but it was a Frenchman named Major Esterhazy who did give over some of the French secrets to the Germans. The French army ignored and suppressed this, and they forged documents showing that Dreyfus was really the guilty party. Dreyfus was convicted of treason in a closed courtroom before a military tribunal. He was stripped of his rank and sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island off the coast of French, of French Guinea in South America. Devil's Island, Kishmo Kaku as its name, that's what it was like. On January 3rd, 1895, before Dreyfus left the country, he was paraded through the streets of Paris, in the middle of Paris, and the cries went out, death to the Jews. That was the screams on the streets of Paris as they paraded the Benedict Arnold, the treasonous Alfred Dreyfus. Meanwhile, the travesty of the Dreyfus trial created a controversy. France's greatest writer, and this is when being a writer and a playwright, there was no television, <laughs> there was no internet. If you were the greatest writer, you had a voice. The greatest writer of France, he was a liberal Catholic, his name is Emile Zola. He published a stunning newspaper article in 1898, this is years after the Dreyfus, he had been looking into it after the fair, he was already on Devil's Island, called Je Accuse, I Accuse, where he charged the government and the army of a miscarriage of justice. For this, Zola was accused of libel and actually had to leave France for a couple of years to England. Eventually, Dreyfus, in 1906, after another trial where he was convicted, was eventually pardoned and exonerated years later, 12 years later, and, we, and, and, he, was, and he actually fought in World War I, believe it or not. But one of those covering this Dreyfus trial was a charismatic, politically connected, Hungarian-Jewish journalist from Austria, Dr. Theodore Herzl lived from 1840 to 1904. He was shocked to the core that Jew hatred was so ingrained in civilized French. Herzl was a completely assimilated Jew. His son was not circumcised. He had, until that point, he was Jewish in name only. He never was stepped from the synagogue in his life to that point, and from his married life on. He had no connection to the Jewish people, but the fact that he knew he was a Jew. <coughs> But when he watched this trial going on, he was reporting for it for the Austrian papers. He was shocked to the court. He recorded in his diary as follows. Where? In France? In Republican, modern, civilized France, a hundred years after the destruction, after the Declaration of the Rights of Man? Dreyfus made Herzl obsessed. Herzl believed that the only answer to anti-Semitism was that Jews needed to have a land of their own. If France, which was the country that started the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, if they can parade a Jew through the streets and the masses are screaming, death to the Jews, then there was no hope for the Jews in Europe. If in Paris you can watch and see death to the Jews, there would be no hope for the Jews in Europe. And he went relentlessly throughout Europe, meeting many heads of state in an attempt to gain support for a Jewish that he met with Kaiser, the Kaiser of Germany and many others. In 1896, he published the book, Der Judenstaat, also known as The Jewish State, an attempt, it's actually titled The Jewish State, an attempt at a modern solution of the Jewish question, which transformed him into the leading personality of the nascent Zionist movement. And in 1897, Herzl convened the first Zionist conference in Basel, Switzerland. Present were 197 delegates from 16 countries who formed the initial Zionist policy. This gathering was the first impetus for the, Zion, for, for the state of Israel. Happens to be, it also was the impetus for the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's what the Russian KG, with the NKVD used as their model that the Jews are meeting to sign the world. But Herzl wrote an amazing thing. 
Look at source number nine. Source number nine is a quote from Herzl's diary. Were I to sum up the Basel Congress in one word, which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, it would be this. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. Perhaps in five years, but certainly in 50, everyone will know it. And on September the 1st, 1947, exactly 50 years to the date, the United States Committee on Palestine had hearings on the formation of a Jewish state. And 50 years and nine months later, on May 14th, 1948, the state of Israel was founded. 50 years later, that was in Herzl's diary, which was only seen years later, after his death. Herzl, however, did not see this happen. He had a tragic life. He died at 44 of a heart attack. There was a plan to, again, most of the early Zionists were secular in the state of Israel it was a yearning, but it didn't have to be. They needed a land. So there was a plan called the Uganda Plan. And most of the Western Jews in the Zionist movement supported it. And that was, we would move all the Jews to Uganda. You can imagine Nairobi would have been, you know, you know you could, a Jewish capital will speak Yiddish or whatever Hebrew in Nairobi. And the Jews would go to Uganda. And we moved to Uganda. And Herzl provisionally accepted this as plan. However, the Russian Jewish part of the Zionists would have rejected it wholeheartedly. They did not think that the masses of Jews of the Pale Settlement would be motivated to go to Uganda. And they said, no way. Herzl then switched back to Israel, but the whole affair stressed him out so much that he had a heart attack and died at the age of 44. And the greatest tragedy is what happened to his family. His wife, Julia, who was estranged from him, his marriage suffered due to it, and he actually died a banker man, the Zionist uh, organization actually supported his family after his death because he had no money. He used all his money in traveling to support uh, the, the, the movement. His three children, Pauline, ended up being a drug addict and had, dying of a heroin overdose in Paris, at which point Hans, his son, committed suicide. Hans had first converted to Catholicism. And his third daughter, died with her husband in Theresienstadt during the Holocaust, and their only son committed suicide in 1946. Thus, he had no descendants. Herzl died as in Europe in 1949, after the foundation of the State of Israel. His body is moved to Israel, to Jerusalem, to what's now called Har Herzl, Mount Herzl, which is where many of the dignitaries and military leaders of Israel are buried. Some of the key Zionist personalities. Now, in the beginning, the Zionist movement had one goal, and that is get the Jewish people to the land of Israel. But there were many approaches. The three most uh, broad and popular were its political Zionism, which is what Herzl and Max Nordau um, tried to accomplish, which was, we're not going to go there in mass. Let's get a charter. Let's let Britain or the Ottomans get, tell us the land is ours, and then we'll go. We're going to politically maneuver until they give us the land, and then we'll go. There was practical Zionism, which was headed by Moshe Leib Lillenbaum, who was a very famous Moscow, as I mentioned, in, in Oskola, and Leon Pinsker. They believed, don't go for the charter. <laughs> don't go for the, just go there. If we'll create the facts to the ground, they'll give us a state. If no one's there, it's all hypothetical. Let's just work on Aliyah. Get people to go to the land of Israel, and then it will work out. One person, however, in particular, merged the two. His name was Chaim Weitzman. And we'll discuss now probably four of the key, the most important early Zionists, that's Chaim Weitzman, Ben Gurion, Usher Hirsch, Gerd Ginsburg, and Zev Jabotinsky. Weitzman, however, was the first one after he took over Herzl. He made Zionism into a movement, into a practical movement, what we call synthetic Zionism, where we're going to go for, on both levels. We're going to get people to go to Israel, and we're going to politically maneuver as well. Weizmann was a scientist, and in 1915, he had one of the most important inventions of World War I. That was artificial acetone, which was necessary for gunpowder. And it allowed the British to mass produce gunpowder. 
and it became one of the ways which Britain was over, able to overcome Germany. Weizmann became a very popular person in, in Britain. His acetone converted people to Zionism. So much so that a Lord Arthur Balfour said that Weizmann's acetone converted me to the Zionist movement. Because here you had the leading Zionist of the world, the leading Zionist of the world after Herzl, Chaim Weizmann, who will end up being the first president of the state of Israel, having one of the most important discoveries and innovations of World War I. There was David Ben Gurion. David Ben Gurion was born David Gruen, Gruen in Plonsk, Poland, in their two religious family. He was small in stature, but he was a powerhouse of a person. He did abandon his religion strongly, as we'll discuss later. He arrived in Israel in 1906. He worked in the orange groves and the wine cellars of the early settlements, and he was active in the Paul Eight on the workers of Zion. But early on, he took what at the time were controversial positions. What was that? That immigrants and settlers do not answer to the exiled Jews. We're not answering to the Jews in France who aren't here. We're going to do it our way. If they want to tell us to do, let them come here. Right? They give you guys some money? Fine, I'm the one living here. What are you going to tell me from France and from America how to live here? That would start, by the way, the Israeli trend of, you know, we'll take your money, but don't tell us what to do. Right? <laughs> I mean, we're the ones who are here. He also demanded, he supported Eliezer ben Yudhar Holar, that Hebrew should be the sole language of the, uh, the, the, of the party, and that if you really want to be a party member, you have to come to Israel. You're not a true Zionist if you're living in Poland or Russia. If you really mean what you say, you got to do it. <clears throat> he also made a bad gamble. Ben-Gurion banked on the Ottomans in the beginning of World War I. He believed that we'll get a state with the Ottomans. And then the Ottomans start to persecute the Jews. And he, was, he, changed, he, made, he changed course, he was skipping a lot. And he ultimately came against the Ottomans, he was forced to, to flee the land of Israel, and he went to New York, where he started a party called Achtu Ta'avoda, the United Labor Party, which would then become the seat of the Labor Party of Israel. Labor Zionism, as opposed to the practical political Zionism, focused on a agricultural society. We're going to build kibbutzim. We're going to live socialist policies and socialist ideas. Ben-Gurion's attitude towards religion was malevolent, or at best ambivalent. He did not particularly care for religion. However, we'll see that Ben-Gurion, even though he had a strong dislike, he actually Ben-Gurion for a large part of his end, end of his life was a practicing Buddhist. Ben-Gurion would do something at the beginning of the state because he felt that the state could not have for religious war. And he did something called the status quo agreement. The four major points of this agreement, and this has been the status quo agreement that the reform and conservative bite their nails over this since that time. Right? The status quo agreement said as follows. There would be a state-funded religious network in addition to the secular network. Marriage, divorce, personal status issues, which includes conversion and who is a Jew, as far as marriage, not as far as making aliyah. But as far as could you marry in the land of Israel would be under the hands of the chief rabbinate. Shabbos, not Sunday, not Friday, but the official day of rest in the state of Israel would be Saturday, Shabbos. And that all government bodies, i.e. the army and the embassies, would be kosher. Ben-Gurion, however, was believed wholeheartedly that the religious parties and people would wane as socialism and as secularism dominate. Right? He believed that this is a short-term fix. I mean, actually, when, he, when, he, when he, get, and he allows a lot of exemptions for religious students, when the state was founded, I think there was like 400 students who had religious exemptions from the army, now it's like 100,000. <laughs> right? I and mean, he didn't think in his wildest dreams that there would be a large percentage of religious students. Of course, he banked incorrectly because over a third of the Jewish, about a third of the Jewish people in Knesset today are religious. And almost 40% of people 18 in the state of Israel are religious, not, let alone traditional, right? Ben-Gurion did never believe that. The third key personality of the early Zionists 
was Usher Hirsch Ginsburg. Anyone heard of him? Usher Hirsch Ginsburg? Okay. Achad Ham, right. AKA Achad Ham. He was originally also a Moscow. And like his friends, when he saw the Russian oppression, he changed fold. He became the great intellectual leader of the cultural Zionist movement. In 1897, he wrote a book called The Jewish State and the Jewish People. The Jewish State and the Jewish People. Where he clarified that the Jewish state was not just a refuge for the oppressed Jewish people of the world, but a place where the modern Jew could create a new, secular, progressive, enlightened state, which would become the center of a new, modern Jewish culture. Right? We'd be a big, you know, Jewish museum. We'd have Brandeis in there, we'd have University of Judaism, or we'd have Achad Ha'am, and Ash, and all of that, that's what we would be. And Ginsburg, if you read his writings, he would create the image of a Hebrew. We were no longer Jews. We were Hebrews. And in fact, many of his fathers changed their names. Ben Ami, Ben Gurion, right? Not Gurion. Pereski will become Peretz. Should be Peretz. Right? All of them would change their names. And no longer would be a gullish Jew, an exiled Jew, who was viewed as weak and submissive to the people around him. But we would be. Israeli Jews. We would be proactive, we would be strong, we would be rid of any gullus, any aspect of the exile, including Yiddish. <laughs> Yiddish was out the door as far as Achad Ha'am was concerned. Hebrew only. Yiddish was the language of Poland and Russia, the language of the exile. Achad Ha'am was aware that we would not have been here if it wouldn't have been for religiosity. Jews would never have made it through Spain. They could have converted very easily. It was because of the Bible and, and, and religious studies. However, the Bible from now on will be used as a source of Jewish history and culture, but there was no room for religion or ritual in the modern Jewish state. I remember many years ago, I went on a family trip to Israel. I had a very, very knowledgeable secular tour guide. I think I, I, he was, his favorite book in the world was Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. And his second favorite book, was Michener's uh, the, the source. And I was pretty, I that point I read all these books very well. I went neck to neck with him and then I really scared the daylight out of him by going neck to neck with the Bible. Because he looked at the Bible as a textbook. Like Greeks would look at mythology. Mm -hmm. He would we'd go to Megiddo or we'd go to the Shomron and he knew, the, he knew the rocks. But it was all just Jewish history. It's culture. No fear of Hashem. Right? And I kind of I'm viewed Jewish culture to be exactly that. The one, to an extent, secular exception to everything of these, the first three, on every level, was Zev Vladimir Jadabatinsky, who was a Zionist leader, journalist, orator. He was a great author, so much so that Maxim Gorky lamented that the Zionists got him because he could have been the greatest author in Russia. He was a powerful speaker. And he started what's called the revisionist Zionism. They supported, first of all, economic liberalism. They were not socialists. But more profoundly, they believed that Jews have to fend for themselves, that Jews deserve both sides of the Jordan, not just one side of Jordan. And the land of Israel is ours. They had almost a romantic view of the state of Israel. They had a positive view of it. They were not necessarily anti-religious, but they were not religious. Be Begin, who would take over for Jabotinsky, was a very pious Jew. He put on tefillin every day. He would put on a yarmulke when he, when he quoted a verse. He davened, he, he, he would come from the revisionist. In 19, and as opposed to Ben Gurion, Jabotinsky believed that the British, British would win the war, and that the British would give the Jews a state if we back them. So Jabotinsky and a person named Joseph Trumpledor, who dies in World War I, together convinced the British, let there be a Jewish legion in World War I. And that's how the Zion Mule Corps would be founded. Later in 1920, he ordered a Jewish, he organized a Jewish self-defense group in Palestine. And they, they did not, uh, kind of like Kach uh, today, they didn't, they did, the Arabs hit the Jews, they didn't hit, a little bit back. They came hard on. 
and the British did not like it, and they sentenced Jabotinsky to 15 years of hard labor. This actually caused a world outcry, and they acquitted Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky, one of the, just, just on a side note, but it's important to know this, from 1936 on, he dies in 1940, he was possessed that a great destruction is going to happen to Europe. He was convinced that Euro European Jewry was over. Hitler was already in power in Germany, but he had not even been to the Rhineland yet. No one could imagine. He was still out of a very small army at that point in the 1930s. But Jabotinsky was convinced that there was no more hope in, 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 in Europe. And he went ahead and had a plan. He spoke to the heads of Poland, Romania, uh, Poland, Romania, and Hungary about letting all the Jews come to Palestine. And he actually got the approval of the heads of Poland, Romania, and Hungary to let the Jews immigrate en masse. Now, the Polish Jews, and actually to an extent, made him suspect, because if you were dealing with an anti-Semitic Polish government, uh, you know, imagine the following case. You tell the African Americans, we worked out a deal with David Duke. We're going to make your life easier. I mean, I mean, was that very convincing to them? David Duke cares about us. Right? So Jews, oh, why did he deal with the Polish government? But he actually got the approval. However, the British had had the white papers. They, they nixed the plan. And Weizmann did it as well. Jabotinsky, two years later, in 1938, gave a very powerful speech in Poland. My, actually, my Bobby, she's a little well, she's at 100 now. She, I remember in my youth, she would tell me about Jabotinsky. She, she was actually had seen him. And she was affected. She was never a revisionist Zionist. She was Hasidic background, but he was a powerful. She remembers him in Poland. In 1938, Jabotinsky gave the following speech. He says, we are living on the edge of a volcano. And he said, if we do not get out now, there will be super pogroms. Get to Palestine as ASAP. Of course, a year later, the war st started. <coughs> Jabotinsky also started what's called Etzel. Irgun Svalu Ume, i.e. the Irgun, which we'll see will take a much more militaristic approach to the British. In 1940, while visiting Beitar, which was the revisionist youth group, in New York, Jabotinsky dies. In his last will, he says, I would like to come back when there's a Jewish state. Do not move my body until there's a Jewish state. But as opposed to Herzl, who was brought back in 1949, Jabotinsky was not brought back until 1964 by the third prime minister of the state of Israel, Levi Eshkol, and the reason was as follows. Ben-Gurion despised the revisionists. Ben-Gurion, for almost 15 years in the Knesset, never referred to Menachem Begin by his name. One of the largest parties. Now, Begin would eventually take over. But Begin, he despised Begin. He despised, he despised the revisionists. He would call them fascists and Nazis. And the remarkable thing is when Begin would take over in 77, the Likud, which was founded, Likud was founded by the followers and the Cherut party at one point was also, the Likud and were viewed as Nazis. If you read when Begin took over, the terrorists have taken over Israel. That's how the Western world viewed the followers of Jabotinsky because, primarily because of Ben-Gurion, who always referred to them as that. And when Levi Eshkol, who was only in power for a year or two, when he would become prime minister, actually Ben Gurion would knock him out in the Lavon affair in 65, but it was Levi Eshkol who brought Jabotinsky back. The Orthodox reaction to Zionism. Now, imagine the Jews without kippahs eating pig against religion, and they're going to rebuild the land of Israel. I mean, and you're a Hasidic Jew living in Russia or Poland. You're an, a Misnagdic Jew living in Vilna. How are you going to view it? These people are bringing us back. Leon Pinsker, the Maskil Achad Ha'am, who believes that the, the Bible is a history book. And the strong rabbi, I mean, the, if you ever look at, I have a, a friend who was uh, very egalitarian conservative. He used to come to my house when I was in law school. And he showed me, he had, he had it from the old kibbutznik, you know, Haggadahs. You know, the, I mean, the, the communist Haggadah, you know, they had, they, they had Yom Kippur balls, chametz parties on Pesach. I mean, 
this to religious Jews is, 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 is crazy. Especially if you look over and over in Devarim, time after time, in 7th seven, seven, seven parak, 8th parak, 10th parak, 11th parak, the Torah stresses that the only way you can live in the land of Israel is to be following God's law, and that we got kicked out of the land of Israel for that. Look at the language of the Tzadik HaKom, one of the great Hasidic leaders of Lublin, source number 10. We surely know that if we were believers and truly trust in the salvation of the Lord, and were observers of the commandments of God, we could even today be dwelling in our holy land. Why did the land perish? Because they abandoned my laws which I put before them. It has already been made clear that the Zionists reject all the commandments and cleave to every manner of abomination. It may be assumed that if the Zionists gain domination, they will seek to remove the hearts of Israel, belief in God and in the truth of Torah. They have thrown off their garments of assimilation, they left Haskalah, and put on a cloak of zeal, so they appear zealous on the behalf of Judaism. They are in fact digging a mine beneath our faith and seeking to lead Israel from beneath the wings of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. So says Rav Tzadik HaKar in Lublin. Rav Tzadik the leading sage of the 10th century Babylonia, said, Am Yisrael, Jewish people, were a nation by the virtue of the acceptance of Torah. Zionism, secular Zionism, hardcore secular Zionism, motto became, our people as a nation because of culture, geography, nationalism, and a reaction to persecution. Even the religious Zionists, which we'll discuss now, never agreed at all with any of these things of secular Zionism. However, what they did believe is that if we have a pragmatic approach, we can have a workable agreement with them. The vast majority of European Jewry did not buy it. You can't work with people who, who, who eat, have Yom Kippur balls, eat chametz on Pesach, and who want to spread that and missionize that as well. And in fact, we'll see that in the foundation of the state of Israel, the first few years, the state purposefully tried to assimilate Jews to, to, to secular Zionism. In particular, the Sephardic communities that came over, the reason Begin will come to power in 1977, you know, Shas, if you look at Shas from Avadios' party, the motto of Shas is, Nachser Atoro Lishonah, bringing the crown to its former glory, because when the majority of Yemenite, Iraqi Jews came to Israel, they were observant, they were religious, and they were put onto secular kibbutz, kibbutzim and purposefully told, uh, told that you do not need Torah in the land of Israel. Right? You can look at any history book of the land of Israel to see this. Right? They were told this is what the land of Israel is. And the Sephardim, as opposed to the religious, since they only left religion, it was not intellectual. It's why they're so easy to be Baal say they never really left. It was always a, an outside assimilation, whereas Ashkenazi Jews assimilated in Europe. And they just brought that assimilation to the land of Israel. Right? Sephardic Jews always had a base, and which is why today, you talk about the Balchu movement in Israel, it's 80-90% Sephardic. Right? You talk about the power of Shas and Avad Yosef, it's, it's even Shuvu. <laughs> you go to these Russian schools, they're almost all of them Bukharians. They're, they're majority Sephardic. Chinuch Hatzmai, it's majority Sephardic. Right? Because the Sephardic never bought into an opposite system. While the majority of European rabbis took an anti-Zionist or very negative view, amongst the rabbis of Israel were the most pro-Zionist, the most fervent believers in, in the return to the land. As mentioned previously, Baron Rothschild was convinced by Rabbi Shmuel Molliver to give money. He was a religious Zionist. In 1862, a German Orthodox rabbi, Tzvi Hirsch Kalischer, who was a student of Rabbi Kiva Eger and the Nesivis, published his tractate, Drisha Tzion, positing that the salvation of Jews promised by the prophets can only come about by Jews going back. The greatest figure, however, and the most famous figure, however, was Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Chalkayin Kok. Rav Kok was a Hasidic Jew who learned in the primary Lithuanian yeshiva. He was a student of the Lajin, student of the Nitziv and Rav Chaim Salvechik. 
and he was a very big Kabbalist. And Rev Koch, who would become the first chief rabbi of, that was of Palestine, he looked at these Jews, secular Jews, that they don't even realize what they're doing. They're doing God's work. These secular Jews, they're really, what's possessing them to build the land of Israel? What's possessing them to, to deal with malaria? They don't even realize it. It's a spark within them. This is all part of the messianic process. They're on the extreme right with Satmar and those kind of views that, in this, that, that even if you have a religious state, you cannot have a state before Messiah. Most of the religious Jews, the vast majority, did not believe in that. They just wanted a state built by religious Jews. But Rav Kook actually believed that the Messiah could come from completely even anti-religious Jews. And in his book, Orot, he spoke about the spark of Jews who were building the land, not knowing with it they're really doing God's work. Look at source number 11. This is Rav Kook. <coughs> Secular Zionists may think that they're doing it for political, national, or, or socialist reasons. But in fact, the actual reason for them coming to resettle in Israel is a religious spark in their soul planted by God. Without their knowledge, they are contributing to the divine scheme and actually committing a great mitzvah. The role of religious Zionists is to help them establish a Jewish state and turn the religious spark in them into a great light. They should show them the real source of Zionism and that the long of Zion is Judaism and teach them Torah with love and kindness. In the end, they will understand that the laws of the Torah are the key to true harmonious, harmony and a socialist state, not in a Marxist meaning, that will be a light for the nation and bring salvation to the world. That's what Rav Kook held. In the Fifth Zionist Conference, the Congress in 1901, the founder of Mizrahi, Rabbi Yitzhak Yaakov Ryan, who was a Rosh Hashiva in Latvia, found the Mizrahi, which is today called the National Religious. Mizrahi literally stands for America's Ruchani, the spiritual center, and he built Mizrahi. Today, the Mizrahi movement, which is typical by wearing kippahs to God, are, you know, a, 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 any article, if you read Zionism today, is the word post Zionist. Any, any article on the land is post Zionism. They're still Zionists, that's the religious Zionists. <laughs> they are super Zionists, and they have a scheme. The Mizrahi tends to be B'nai Akiva, and the founders of Rav Kook himself was never that. He would call Kardal. Kharedi Dati Lil which means super Zionist, but very pious. And his followers are the overwhelming majority of the religious settler movement in Yudia, Vishonon, aka the West Bank. They will wear very big sugas, usually pious, very pious. They would be, today, if you look at the armed corps, the fighting units of the IDF, the majority are people from the religious Zionist movement. Notwithstanding what Orthodox held about the Zionist movement, Jews, including Orthodox Jews, came, start, kept coming to Israel. And in the second Eliyah, which followed the Kishinev massacre, 40,000 Jews moved between 1904 and 1914. In the, in the third Eliyah, Following World War I and the Russian Revolution, brought another 35,000 Jews. And by this time, the dream of a Zionist state, of a Jewish state, was no longer a dream. Because in World War I, the British had taken control of the land of Israel. Now, it's important to keep in mind, I think there's a presidential candidate who said this just this weekend, yeah. that there's never been a state called Palestine. I'm not endorsing your good marriage, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. There's never been a state called Palestine. There was always the Ottoman Empires and Muslims before them. There was never a Palestine. And when the British would take over this country, they actually get a mandate to, do, to build a Jewish state. But before the mandate, remember that Balfour had loved Weizmann? He said he was converted to Zionism. Well, as the war comes to an end in 1917, Arthur Balfour wrote to his good friend, Sir Rothschild, that His Majesty's government looks up with favor upon the pa establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people. This was the first that Britain had just taken over, or actually they had not taken over, it was a month before England took over Palestine. They were saying they would give it back. Unfortunately, it would have been even a more dramatic statement. Remember I said that the German and American Reformed Jews were rapidly anti-Zionist, not for the religion, for the opposite reasons there was an orthodox reaction. 
to them, Zionism was Jewish nationalism. We're Germans. We're Americans. We're Hollywood stars. We're American. We're Yankees. We have apple pie. We're not being Zionists. One of the most prominent reformed liberal Jews in England was a person, a very famous Edwin Montague, who was a liberal reformed Jew intermarried, who was actually the Secretary of State for India from 1917 to 1922. He was a very powerful man. And he actually modified the Balfour Declaration. So it, it was going to be even more profound, and he modified which would have profound effects in the years ahead. But the British, despite getting a mandate by the League of Nations in 1920 and the Balfour Declaration, set about changing the Arab world first. In 1921, the British founded Iraq, and they gave it to Faisal ibn Hussein, the son of Hussein, the sheriff of Mecca, and who was the king. And in 1922, they took what was the Palestine Mandate, cut it, took off west of the Jordan River, which was 75% of the landmass designated for the Palestine Mandate, put a law that no Jews could emigrate there, and gave it to another same son of the Sheriff of Mecca, to Abdullah ibn Hussein, thus taking 75% of the Mandate away. Now, why did they give Iraq to one same son and a, and, and a Jordan to another son of the Sheriff of Mecca? Why right, the the Hussein family are claimed to be from the sense of Muhammad, the Hashemites. They, they, they declare the, the, the sense of Muhammad. They were historically in charge of the religious shrines in Mecca. Well, when the British were fighting against the Ottomans, two families backed them and helped them fight against the Ottomans. One was the Ibn Saud family. They would be rewarded by Saudi Arabia. And the second family was the Hussein family, who would be rewarded with Iraq and Jordan happens to be that these lands are heavily in oil as well, which the British wanted to have a large say. Moreover, there was a British bias against the Jewish state. Why was this? Well, first of all, it was not, even if they had the more Balfour aside, a large percent of the British aristocracy and foreign service were anti-Semites. Right? They were Arabists. They were pro-Arab. And why they said we support the Jews when there are a few hundred thousand of them and tens of millions of Arabs in the Middle East and they have oil. Are we out of our minds to sit here and support the Jews? And they started to backtrack. Meanwhile, the Jews, either oblivious or uncaring with the British were backtracking on the mandate, they were coming still. In the fourth Aliyah between 1924 and 1928, 80,000 Jews came. And the fifth Aliyah, between 1929 and 1939, a quarter of a million Jews came. Many of them, because Russia was closed, the more, they, were, they were under the Iron Curtain of Stalin, but many of them were German Jews getting out of Hitler's Nazi, uh, Nazi empire. The Arabs, however, were not sitting and saying, oh, Bruchima be into the Jews, welcome. <laughs> they started to riot. And the first major riots happened in August 1929. And the Arab mosques instigated that the Jews were going to burn down Al Aska Mosque. Right? By the way, did anyone remember how the, the Second Intifada started? They said they were going to burn down Al Aska Mosque. Sharon went up to the up to the Temple Mount. They're planning to take over the mosque. That's not a new trick. 1929, the Mufti of Jerusalem already told the Arab preachers, say that they're planning to take down the Al Aska Mosque, and riots spread throughout the land of Israel. And the worst riots were the, the ancient city of Hebron, where 67 Jews were killed, primarily students of the yeshiva, of the Slobodka yeshiva, of the Hebron yeshiva. The Slobodka yeshiva were then moved to Jerusalem, and were for, to this day we call the Hebron yeshiva, because it was originally in Hebron. <clears throat> the 1930s saw more massacres and more riots, and in 1937, it, it, as a, a, in, 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 in result of this, there was the British Peel Commission, which actually said, believe it or not, we're going to give the Jews a small state. We're going to give the Jews a small sliver of a state, but we're going to first ban immigration until we can get to, to, to get things under control. Well, the Arabs exploded and actually revolted against England to a large extent. And the Arab revolt was led by the Mufti of Jerusalem, who the British originally put in power. The Mufti 
was a rabid anti-Semite. If you read Alan Dershowitz's book, The Case for Israel, it's a good book, by the way, if you want to ever you know how to deal with uh, you know, anti-Zionism. The, the amazing thing is that Israel, by the secular Zionist, was supposed to be the answer to anti-Semitism. There is no one trigger around the world today that it causes anti-Semitism as much as Israel. Almost without fail, all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. I mean, if you cut under the veneer, it's almost all anti-Semitism. Well, Dershowitz makes a good argument. He goes to the Mufti of, 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 of Jerusalem, um, Haj Amin al-Husseini, his, his uh, nephew is somebody called uh, Arafat. Anyone heard of him? Yeah. Uh, Husseini would escape eventually and end up, there are many famous pictures of Husseini sitting there with Adolf Hitler. He encouraged the Holocaust. In fact, he founded an SS unit which killed Jews in the Balkans. After the war, he was able to escape and ended up dying in Beirut, but not before he had King Jordan, the King of Jordan, Jordan Abdullah, killed because he felt he was too pro-Zionist, too pro the Jewish state in 1951. His son would rule for many, grandson, his son or grandson, but I can't right now, ruled for many years afterwards. The British backtracked on the Balfour Agreement, it backtracked on the Peel Commission's uh, idea of creating a Jewish state, but they did not backtrack on the Peel Commission's idea of shutting down Jewish immigration to Palestine. And this was in 1938 and 1939. In the most crucial years, the time after Kristallnacht, when hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of Jews would be trying to get out, the doors to Palestine were closed. Jews snuck in, and that approximately 115,000 Jews were saved from the Holocaust because they took illegal immigration, which was called Aliyah Bet. But millions of Jews died because Palestine was closed. So much so the British had a blockade, a blockade of Palestine. This led to resistance. Now Ben Gurion, who was the head of the Jewish agency, had a Haganah, a Haganah, which was actually Jewish self-defense. But it didn't want to antagonize the British. The reason they had a Haganah was because the British did nothing to protect the Jews. They did nothing. So the Jewish agency had a Haganah, but it was the replacement of Jabotinsky, who really rocked the boat. His name was Menachem Begin. Begin was imprisoned by the Russians, the communists, because communists, actually Begin writes in his diary that when he was in jail, he met a, a communist Jew. And he said, why do you hate the Zionists so much? So this communist Jew told Begin, because you take the best of our minds. <laughs> right? You take the best, the best of our minds. Begin gets out of Russia, they actually freed him. He gets to the land of Israel, and immediately he's one of the heads of the revisionist movement in, in, in Europe, takes over the revisionist movement and the Irgun. Begin does not take a passive stance to, towards the British. Jumping ahead a few years, just going back to Ben Gurion's dislike of Begin and the revisionists, on June 21st, 1948, and as the war of independence is going on, the Atalina, which is an Ergon sh shipboat, start, brought in ship, was bringing arm, arm uh, was bringing weapons. Now, the Sahal was not yet united at that point. There was a Haganah, and there was an Ergon. Ben Gurion had the ship sunk. And it was at that point, which there was almost a civil war in Israel, but Begin bit his lip, and he told the Ergon, put down your weapons. All right, we cannot have a civil war. And then actually the Irgun merged with the Haganah, and that's how you got Sahal. But at the point, there were separate militias. That's how this Jewish state, and the family Jewish state that happened. An even more radical group than the Irgun was Loichme, listen to the title, Loichme Cheret Yisrael, the fighters of the liberation of Israel, Lechi. One of the, was founded by Avram Stern, who was killed in 1942 by the British. One of the heads of Lechi was a future prime minister himself, named Yitzhak Shamir. And then a remarkable thing happened. It's unbelievable how divine providence works. In a stunning, stunning display of lack of hakar satov, of complete ingratitude, complete ingratitude. You know, I just saw that the BBC in the 20th century ranked the most important British citizen of the 20th century was Winston Churchill. <laughs> the most important British citizen of the 20th century was Winston Churchill. He had literally saved a country from complete demolition. It was destroyed when he took over in the summer of 1940. 
in 1945, as the war comes to its end, Winston Churchill gets voted out of office, overwhelmingly for the labor. And it put into power at, at labor's Clement Attlee and as the Prime Minister and Ernest Bevan, who was a gruff, opinionated, anti-Semitic union leader as the, the head of the Secretary of State. He was the Foreign Service a Foreign Secretary. So Churchill had positive feelings to, to, to the state, uh, to, to Zionism. Some are positive. He wasn't Arthur Balfour, but he was somewhat positive. But they now, after the Holocaust, Britain had an anti-Zionist government, which would bring things to the hilt. It would bring it up. I would, and you, and would imagine, what if Churchill were state of power? Would we have had a state in 1948? Would it have caused all of the things that happened in the next three years or not? It's unbelievable. Right? Who would have thought Winston Churchill would have gotten voted out of office had literally saved Britain from destruction? And Bevan was rattling at the center. When Truman saw the DP camps, he requested Bevan to take in 100,000 Jews into, into Israel. From the DP camps, the Jews were suffering. Bevan's report, re retort to Truman was, that is only because you don't want too many of them in New York. <laughs> you don't want too many Jews in New York. That's why I thought it was the Palestine. By the way, Bevan was in New York meeting with Truman at the time. And the Jews were, of course, of, of, but the whole country was offended by that remark. And the Stevedores, the Port New York, refused to put Bevan's luggage on the boats as he returned to London. He had to actually take his own luggage back on, or maybe some of his associates. Um, Britain kept the blockade of Palestine, and the Ogun kept up the pressure. And in 1946, the Ogun blew up. It's still there today. I'm sure some of us have been there. The King David Hotel in Jerusalem. Now, Begin, in his memoirs, talked about, the, the, and this is a fact, actually, this is corroborated, that they actually warned the British that they were going to bomb the hotel. But he was, the British official said back to him, we don't take orders from Jews. <laughs> so they didn't evacuate the hotel, and 91 people were killed. The British then hanged two Ergun two, two fighters, and the Ergun kidnapped two British soldiers and hung two of them. And then, perhaps in the most audacious feat, they broke into the, to the this is like, they break into Alcatraz at the time, into the British fortress of Akko and Acre and free the prisoners. Jews were coming in, the pressure was on, the exodus comes to the land right, with rural detention on the exodus coming, 4,500 Jews, all Holocaust survivors, people with numbers on their arms, Holocaust survivors, and they come to the land of Israel and they turned away in Haifa. Look at source number 11. Abba Ibn, <laughs> Abba Ibn, who was the Jewish liaison, he would later be the, the, the Israel representative of the United Nations, right? He persuades four UN, UN representatives to come to Haifa as the exodus is there. This is from Martin Gilbert's Israel History, source number 11. In Haifa, the four members watched... 12. 12. In Haifa, the four members watched the gruesome operation. The Jewish refugees had decided not to accept banishment with salty. If anyone to know what Churchill meant by a squalid war, we have found that by watching British soldiers using rifle butts, hose pipes, and tear gas against the survivors of the death camps. The men, <coughs> women, and children were forced to be taken off the prison ships, locked in cages below decks, and set out pal of Palestine's war of waters. When the four me members of the Scott came back to Jerusalem, even recalled they were pale with shock. I could see they were preoccupied with one point alone. If this was the only way that the British mandate could continue, it would be better not to continue it at all. Britain then at this point said, we've had enough. There were 100,000 British soldiers in late 1947, watching over 600,000 Jews and 1.2 million Arabs. Just by means of comparison, when England left <coughs> India, there were 100,000 soldiers in India India had a population of 350 million people. And England was before she was 100,000 people on the blockade and keeping peace in the land of Israel. They said, enough. And they gave it to the United Nations. And there was a partition plan. The partition plan was to give Israel a small slice, not really continuous, with the worst parts of Israel, with having the Jewish population. Because remember, the Jewish population were able to buy the worst parts of Israel at the time. The Arabs were going to get the Gaza Strip, Sfat, a large part of Galilee was supposed to be Arab. 
um, the entire chunk of what's called today the West Bank. Jerusalem, under the partition plan, plan was supposed to be under international control. Skipping a lot, on November 29th, 1947, the, the partition plan came to a vote in the United Nations. And the most unbelievable thing happened. Both the United States and Russia. Russia, which a year or two later, by the, by the summer of 1949, which we will be putting out anti-Zionist, anti-Israel proclamations, Stalin, for a moment, a moment, backed the Jewish state. And both Russia and the United States voted. The vote was 33 for, 13 against, 11 abstentions. Of the 13 against, 10 of them were... 10 of them were uh, Muslim states. The 10, the 10 Muslim states all voted against. It was on Shabbos. They were a great rabbinim. Now, when I talked about the anti-Orthodox approach, there's always before the state and after the state. Of course, the early years still mixed. There's a mixed emotions, but both the Zionists today are not the Zionists of 80 years ago and 70 years ago and 60 years ago. In fact, the state looks like in the next 30, 40 years it's going to become religious, everything being, everything being equal. The feelings were mixed, or how it had, had changed. But Rav Shradl Feigl and many others, Rav Shradl was the head of Torah Das, he left their radio on Shabbos. Jews throughout the world left the radio, Orthodox Jews, to hear the vote. And Rav Shradl Feigl Mendelovitz heard the vote. He said, Abrocha, Shechianu, Vikimanu, Vikimanu, Lazman Hazet. And we have come to a day where the unthinkable happened, where the Jewish people were going to give, to give it a state. The British, however, were stung by this vote. They had abstained. They were stung. And the British decided that they were going to be pro-Arab. They were not willing to leave Palestine. What they really wanted were the Jews to be defeated and cried for the British back, give up their hope of a Jewish state, and be under British dominion. So they started giving the Arabs their weapons and kept the embargo on, on, on Israel. There's many books about this, by the way. I'm just, Anyone wants supposed to come after it. They kept the embargo on the Jews. The Jews had to, to sneak in weapons. And they gave their positions and their weapons and work with the, Jew, the, the Arab Legion of Jordan. And then within those four months from November 29th, when the British started to leave, a thousand Jews were killed. One of the worst incidents, of course, was April 13th, 1948, where a convoy, a convoy of doctors and nurses trying to make a way to the siege of Jerusalem were... Um, taken, uh, were ambushed, and a seven-hour shootout could, would happen where 77 of these doctors and nurses were killed on the way to Hadassah Hospital. Jerusalem, even before the state, was under siege. Uh, the old city was under siege. The war had started before the state was pro proclaimed. In fact, it would cause international pressure to stop the declaration of the state of Israel. And the siege of Jerusalem was one of the fiercest fightings before even a declaration of war. Now, Egypt, and Syria, and Iraq, and Lebanon, we're not going until the British left, until the declaration. But already there's a siege in Jerusalem. And the, the Jerusalem was cut off. The old city, we were not able to get food, and there was hunger that reigned. And an unbelievable thing happened. The Jews took over the Castel for a day, which is well, the high point, which the British had given to the Arabs. And the Arabs had a counterattack. And in that counterattack, some young Yemenite Jew, who was by chance, is not known as one of the top military people, killed the head of the Arab Legion attacking Jerusalem. Al Hussein, who was also a relative of the Mufti. And the Arabs went back and they stopped their counterattack. So for the next few hours, 24 hours, the Jews were able to get un uninterrupted food in Jerusalem. They did 250 trucks worth of food went into Jerusalem the next 24 hours through the pass. It was Shabbos. Jews, Talesim, go went out and carry the food out. It's literally life and death. And then the road to Jerusalem got cut again. Eventually, they built a bypass road to Jerusalem called the Burma Road, which saved uh, a large part of Jerusalem. May 14th, the 5th of the ER, 4 p.m., British lowered their flag, and immediately the Jews raised their own. They took the flag, which was from the first Zionist Congress in 1897, the color was white, like a talus, clean as whiteness, and the blue stripes were like a talus. Let's look at source number 13. This is David Ben Gurion, who declaring independence. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here, the spiritual, religious, and national identity was formed. 
Here they achieved independence and created a culture of national universal significance. Here they wrote and gave the Bible, exile from Palestine, the Jewish people remained faithful in, to it in all its countries of the dispersion, never ceasing to pray and hope for the return and restoration of a national freedom. Accordingly, we the members of the National Council met together in solemn assembly today and by virtue of the natural historic right of the Jewish people and with the support of the resolution of the General Council, General of the United Nations, hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. We offer peace and amity to all neighboring states and the peoples invite them to cooperate with the independent Jewish nation for the common good of all. With the trust of the Rock of Israel, we set our hands at this de declaration at the session of the Provisional Council in the city of Tel Aviv on Shabbos Eve, the 5th of ER. Now, the Rock of Israel, by the way, they don't say the God. In the American Declaration of Parents, we say God. Mm -hmm. The Rock was a compromise. The communists, the Mapam, which were a large part, refused to put God in the Declaration of State. So they used Rock, which could have been interpreted in many ways. That was the compromise in the Declaration of Independence. The first country to recognize Israel exactly 11 minutes after the declaration was the United States by Harry Truman. Truman was under tremendous pressure. In fact, his Secretary of State George Marshall threatened Truman that if he would endorse the State of Israel, if he would recognize the State of Israel, he would run against him in a primary in the next election. And his whole foreign service went berserk. But Truman, it's, he, he viewed himself literally as Cyrus. He, in fact, he said so as, as a letter, voted for the state of, of Israel. Listen to what Minister Zev Sharif, who was the first civil commissioner, described the scene. This was, it was the scene of when, when, when they declared, declared the state. Rabbi Hudalay Fishman, who was one of the heads of uh, the National Religious Party, delivered the benediction of Shekhiyan of Kiyaman of Yiyan of Lazman Zev, who has kept and sustained this embrace to this day which the aged rabbi did in a trembling voice, choked with emotion. Suddenly, the full impact of what had been done came home. The significance of the creation of the state, as the signing of the document had ended, Hatikva was struck up by the orchestra, and it seemed that if the heavens had opened and were pouring out a song of joy on the rebirth of the nation, the audience stood motionless, transfixed. The state of Israel was established. This meeting, is ended, it had taken 32 minutes in all to proclaim the independence of a people for 1,187 years have been under the servitude of other nations. People embraced and people were dancing in the streets, but not for long. That night, Tel Aviv was bombed by the Egyptians. And immediately, five Arab armies representing 45 million people attacked the state of 600,000 Jews. And against all odds, the Jews won. So much so, the Parade Magazine, which is still a magazine of many of the Sunday newspapers today, Parade Magazine, in its review of 1948, characterized the Israeli victory over the Arabs as the upset of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but the victory was bittersweet. The Jews lost the old city. And of course, the Jordanians would abuse the old city, close off the Jews, account, contrary to the, 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 the armistice agreement. They would use the Mount of Olives they would abuse the graves. The War of Independence lasted for 13 months. It was Israel's costliest war, taking 1% of the population. That, that would be approximately 3, 3 million Jews today, 3 million Americans dying in a war. <coughs> Vietnam took 50,000 Americans. But the War of Independence made Israel's borders more secure, more safe. The Arabs, of course, did not easily accept it in the defeat in 1948. And in 1967, just jump ahead, Egyptian President Gamal now Al Nasser declared the streets of Tehran, Israel sees the Ilat closed. On, on, June, on May 27th, he declared our basic objective will be the destruction of Israel. Egypt, Syria, Jordan had signed a pact with Israel. And Israel, if you look at the New York Times editorials for the week before, the first week of June, it's almost always the, the, the political cartoons, this big fat, like, you know, uh, Aladdin, Aladdin Arab sitting on a sword, and you see a little Jew crumbled over, right? and Israel was in mortal danger. And the pundits would have said, this is it. Israel, looking at a life in that situation, on June 5th, 1967, 
surprised the Egyptian army and knocked 400 Egyptian airplanes down on the ground in Egypt, thus ending the war with Egypt essentially on the first day. Jordan did not declare war until a day later, and Israel didn't attack their air force. But Jordan didn't react. You know why? Because Nasser told Hussein, this is before Twitter, <laughs> we're winning the war! Tel Aviv is being bombed! So when Jordan declares war in Israel, they had no idea that the Egyptian air force had been destroyed. And their own air force got destroyed the next day completely as well. And the remarkable thing that when Jordan came into the war, the Israelis, of course, they conquered the Golan Heights, they conquered the West Bank, and they conquered Sinai. But most importantly, they conquered the Western Wall. They conquered Jerusalem again. And for the first time in 1900 years, Jerusalem was in, 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 in Jewish hands. Absolutely remarkable. You know, this is the end of the Jewish history series, and I started, it was Siege of the Rome in Jerusalem. And when you really think about it, the return of the Jews to Israel, I mean, just tonight's lecture, is against all odds, and against all rational reason. It really highlights Jewish history. You had the Jewish people come back to Israel and Jerusalem after 1900 years of being in dozens of countries and abused three years after the Holocaust, in the most bizarre circumstances, had to work out, but that is Jewish history. No one ever, no country, no nation ever left for, for, for dozens of years, let alone over 19, almost 1900 years, and come back. It came back. Look at source number 14. <laughs> Meaning of History by Professor Nikolai Berdyshev. Our, sur our survey of three and, a three and a half millennia of Jewish history is closed. But the story which we have set ourselves to, to tell is unending. Today is 1935, before the Holocaust, before the state of Israel, before anything. Today the Jewish people has in it still those <coughs> elements of strength and endurance which enabled it to surmount all the crisis of its past, surviving thus the most powerful empires of antiquity. The Jews have played an all-important role in history. They are preeminently a historical people and their destiny reflects the indestructibility of the divine decrees. Their destiny is too imbued with the metaphysical to be explained either in material or positive historical terms. Skip to the third paragraph. The survival of the Jews, their resistance to destruction, their endurance under absolutely peculiar conditions, and the faithful role played by them in history, all these point to the particular and mysterious foundation of their destiny. And I'd like to end with Cecil Roth. This is his history of the Jews and how he ends his book. Throughout our history, there have been weaker elements who have shirked the sacrifices which Judaism entailed. They have been swallowed long since in the great majority. Only the more stalwart have carried on the traditions of their ancestors and can now look back with pride upon their superb heritage. Are we to be numbered with the weak majority or the stalwart minority? Really, Jewish history is a divine hand of Hashem moving the Jewish people throughout history. And more than anything, I hope the people got out of this class. We ended with the siege of Jerusalem. We, 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 ended, we started with the siege of Jerusalem. We'll end with the return to Jerusalem. The Jewish people are eternal. And the question that Jewish history leaves to us is, where will we and our descendants be? Where will we put ourselves? Will we see the hand of Hashem? In, in the world, God runs the world, God's involved in the world, and will that motivate us? And if it does, then this whole series is worth it. Thank you very much for coming.